program, FCIP. I'm going to focus on FCIP because although AFGE generally supports the President's reform for the competitive service, we do not believe that these reforms will have much impact unless the non-competitive or accepted service FCIP is drastically curtailed. The FCIP is the government's most widely used and problematic special hiring authority. It's essentially a direct hiring program that bypasses open competition and veterans preference and circumvents career <coughs> ladder promotion opportunities for the incumbent workforce. FCIP gives agencies enormous discretionary authority to hire employees without using competitive hiring processes or the public notice ordinarily required by law. AFGE strongly objects to the continued use of the FCIP because it has nearly superseded the competitive service and because it has become a preferred vehicle for favoritism. The original purpose of FCIP was supposedly, quote, to attract exceptional men and women to the federal workforce who have diverse professional experiences, academic training, and competencies, end quote, and to prepare them for careers in analyzing and implementing uh, public programs. Based on reports from our members, however, agencies have strayed from this purpose by using it as a closed hiring system that does not reach many qualified members of the American public or current federal employees. AFGE does not believe that the federal government can succeed if its primary hiring process evades open competition, the merit system principles, or simple standards of fairness in hiring. In the meantime, federal agencies where we represent the employees, such as the Border Patrol, um, other uh, components of DHS and Social Security, have used FCIP as the almost exclusive hi hiring authority for thousands of newly hired employees. A 2007 GAO report showed that DHS used FCIP more than any other recruitment tool for new permanent hires. Based on these numbers, it seems clear that FCIP hiring has extended well beyond its, uh, the limited number of professional, scientific, and administrative positions that was it was initially envisioned to serve. Agencies looking for an easy way out of the responsibility to honor veterans' preference and open competition have subverted the purpose of FCIP. It now represents an unrestricted use of a hiring authority that is extremely subjective and that grants managers a degree of discretion that shouldn't exist in federal hiring. Further, managers have almost total control over newly hired employees because of the absence of procedural due process protections, such as adverse action appeal rights and a probationary period that is double the length for employees hired under, under the competitive processes. Combined with FCIP's lack of transparency, the above problems have turned FCIP into a step backwards from the basic civil service protections first introduced by the Pendleton Act in 1883. AFGE has urged the Obama administration to eliminate the FCIP, I limit it to a small number of positions, or revise the program <coughs> significantly in order to strike a more appropriate balance between the need for hiring flexibility and the imperative to uphold the principles of transparency and fairness. AFGE is extremely sensitive to agencies' pleas with regard to expedited hiring, especially in the context of insourcing jobs that were inappropriately con outsourced in the last decade. With the recognition that each FTE insourced uh, saves the federal government around $40,000 per year, that's DOD's um, estimates, the financial motivation to insource is substantial. It's become routine for agencies to complain that the competitive hiring process is too cumbersome or time-consuming and use this as an excuse either to resist or delay insourcing or to revert to non-competitive hiring like the FCIP. AFGE does support the administrative effort, administration's efforts to modernize and expedite the competitive hiring process, and we're hopeful that with proper training and resources, managers at agencies throughout the federal government will make use of these new procedures. Uh, we urge the committee to enact legislation that would restrict the use and abuse of all direct hiring authorities in general and the f federal career internship program uh, in particular. Uh, numerical limits at a minimum and other restrictions on FCIP should be accompanied by hiring reforms and increased resources available to agency human, service, human resources offices to expedite both insourcing and the hiring of the next generation of federal employees. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know we're going to return to that question. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Mr. Holloway. Congressman Conley, thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. The federal government is in dire need of hiring reform. The current hiring process used by federal agencies is cumbersome, confusing, and slow. Vacancies often take six months or more to fill. Those who do attempt to apply for federal positions are often baffled by unique requirements or apply and never hear back from agencies again. The 
call the federal hiring process frustrating would be an understatement. The outcome of this process is predictable. Federal agencies often fail to attract the best possible candidates. This failure ultimately hurts agency productivity and minimizes the value federal agencies provide to the American people. I believe our country is at a crossroads where hiring reform has never been so critical. An improved federal hiring system can help alleviate two major crises. The first is the economic downturn. The members of this subcommittee know well that this economic slump is unto our country's work. Unemployment is hovering around 10 percent. Even though some seem to think we may be turning the corner in this recession, many American workers have not begun to feel real improvement. I don't need to tell you the times are tough out there. You see it in your districts every day. We need jobs. People want to work. You can help put Americans back to work through your efforts on this subcommittee by highlighting federal hiring reform. USAjobs.gov, an online clearinghouse for federal jobs, had 40,000, 40,000 vacancies listed last week. These are good paying, budgeted jobs. If the time is shortened between posting vacancies and filling them, tens of thousands of Americans <coughs> will be put back to work. The second crisis we face is not as visible, but is just as real and has been discussed today. Baby boomers are reaching their retirement years. Federal government demographics indicate that agencies will begin to experience a tidal wave of retirement. Quality applicants simply will not wait six months. People deserve a streamlined hiring process, prospect, process that is respectful to applicants. NAGE is encouraged to see the White House and OPM take interest in this critical issue. Last week, President Obama issued an executive memo to federal agencies instructing them to make much-needed reforms to their hiring processes. It is clear that the administration has an appreciation for the fact that the workers are what make federal agencies perform effectively. The federal government simply cannot function without a knowledgeable, motivated, and skilled workforce. Finding the right people with the right skills in a reasonable period of time is critical to recruiting and maintaining that workforce. I want to thank, I want to talk about the cumbersome federal hiring process impacts the agencies where we have members. In the VA, health care providers, federal police, and emergency service workers are the people I want to talk about. Failing to, to fill critical vacancies in these areas can be ma a matter of life and death. The VA estimates it will need to hire over 40,000 health care workers within the next few years. VA hospitals need a hiring process that does not delay the delivery of care to veterans. A short shortage of nurses often leads to unsafe patient-to-staff ratios, which has shown to adversely impact patient outcomes. Our veterans deserve better. DOD project projects that more than half of the police officers guarding our military facilities will need to be replaced within the next few years. We need to be able to replace these federal police officers in a timely fashion. All we risk experience a lapse in security at these installations. The possibility of such a mistake is unacceptable. Regarding the White House efforts on hiring reform, we believe President Obama and OPM Director Berry are moving in the right direction. But as they say, the devil is in the details. Their plan is good, but it will not be a success unless all the agencies are committed and diligent about implementing this plan correctly. It is also critical that reforms do not undermine the merit uh, systems principles or weaken veteran preferences. Regarding some of the specifics, we applaud the elimination of lengthy knowledge, skills, and abilities essays. We view favorably the abolishment of the arbitrary rule of three. We applaud the requirement to tell applicants where they stand at four points during the application process. We approve of bringing operational managers and supervisors into the hiring process earlier and more fully and we are pleased that the administration is taking steps to review the federal career internship program and potentially reduce the government's reliance on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. And I, I feel like I'm back home. Thank you um, very much. Well, and I, I share some of what I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Brighton Alston. Uh -huh. uh, but I, uh, I want to thank you all for your testimony. And I see our chairman has returned. Uh, just a word of uh, caution. Uh, votes are about to be called. Uh, and I think we have four votes, so we're going to have to probably uh, at some point interrupt and I'd urge everyone to be concise 
uh, in their answers so we can try to get in as much as we can. And before I uh, return the gavel to uh, Mr. Lynch, let me just ask uh, Mr. McManus, Mr. Crosby, and Ms. Gilman, we have worked with you and your respective organizations on the in Internship Improvement Act, which is not about FCIP. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity briefly just to expand on why you support that act. Again, I think, uh, I think from the Partnership for Public Services standpoint, uh, as I mentioned before, first it, it, it gives uh, data to federal agencies on what's working and what's not working. How are they converting interns? How are they using interns? Are the internship experiences worthwhile both for the intern and for the agency itself? Secondly, um, I think the establishment of the database that collects intern the, the intern candidates across government does in fact provide a, what, what I termed before a ready, uh, a ready made pool of candidates for fe long-term federal service. And then finally, uh, it really is, is uh, I imperative in, in our estimation that some conversion authority remain in there. Again, with an internship, there is no better way to assess a candidate for an internship or a long-term position than to actually see them do the job and to, and to observe in action both their work and their work habits. I agree with all that. The only thing that I would add is the clarification of understanding what internship programs, in this case, we're talking about for students. And it, were, the, were the language clear, as, you, as this legislation is proposing, we won't, wouldn't have the kinds of controversies that we have with FSIP now. And that is something that NTEU was initially, con that is something that NTEU was initially concerned about, the definition of intern, um, especially based on the ab abuses of the Federal Career Intern Program. Um, as long as we are dealing with students or recent graduates, um, we have no problem with limited um, uh, programs that don't use competitive hiring to attract students to the federal government, and we've um, had uh, a good time working with you and your staff on your legislation to ensure that that's what that would do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize having to run out. Uh, I do want to uh, just offer a special welcome to uh, President Holloway, uh, who uh, has been a longtime uh, friend and uh, and head of uh, NAGE uh, back in Massachusetts, and also uh, Dean Crosby, who also serves our University of Massachusetts. I appreciate your, I appreciate all of the, the witnesses' in, in, input, but uh, I have two local uh, uh, witnesses here today. Uh, let, me, let me just ask, I know that in, uh, Ms. Gilman, your, your testimony, you raised concerns about the the tendency to circumvent the competitive uh, hiring process, especially and, and especially the impact that that might have on veterans hiring. And I, I wonder if you could just amplify a little bit. I share that concern, just looking at the whole uh, framework, and I'm sure you were here for uh, Director Berry's testimony, uh, but you see it day to day. And I, my, my, my fear is just uh, conjectural, I guess, at, at, at my level. but. Could you just expound on that a little bit? Um, yes, we've seen it in many of the agencies where we represent employees. I believe um, uh, Ms. Simon also mentioned it at DHS in particular. Um, they are hiring almost all incoming employees through this intern program. Some of the people that we represent at DHS, Customs and Border Protection Officers, Border Patrol agents, they are not interns. They go through um, federal law enforcement training um, six months of training in some instances, they carry guns, they are not interns and they are not hired on anybody, uh, for anybody thinking that it's a temporary position. They're not students, they're not recent graduates. Um, NTU has actually been involved in three different um, legal challenges to the FCIP, including two on behalf of veterans that were passed over um, in using the FCIP uh, process. And we do think that agencies are using it at least partially to avoid veterans' preference. Um, I think that there was some mention of. Um, Ms. Uh, Gilman, I, is your microphone on? I'm just. Yeah. Okay, could you just yeah. pull it closer to you? Yes. You're giving very important testimony that I, I want to make sure is on the record. Thank you. Um, I think there was some mention of um, looking at this program, uh, uh, at the facts around this program, not just anecdotes. Um, and, I, and I think that the facts are there. The explosion in the use of it, 
um, the fact that we have been very successful in the preliminary stages of our lawsuits um, on the fact that it's uh, not following uh, merit principles and applying veterans' preference, um, and, and uh, the number uh, of agencies that are turning to it. And, and I believe part of the reason is because there are problems with the competitive hiring system that needs reform. But let's right. reform that. Let's not um, go to this other system and use it to completely circumvent com competitive hiring and discriminate against veterans' preference in the process. Thank you. Uh, that's a call for votes. Uh, fortunately, however, the first vote uh, is uh, the naming of the is the naming of a post office. Uh, just for the record, it's the Michael C. Rothberg Post Office in Sharon, Massachusetts. And I'm going to go on the record right here, saying that I fully support the naming of that post office in honor of Michael C. Rothberg. Uh, the bill is offered by Representative uh, Barney Frank, my my friend. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it at that. But that will save us about 40 minutes by me. Uh, not leaving and coming back. So uh, I think we can proceed. I, I, will, I will accept that uh, privilege for myself, but I'm going to yield five minutes to Mr. Conley, who's going to probably have to make this vote. Thank you. I can't uh, miss uh, the naming of a post office and chair, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McManus, maybe I can start with you. We've heard testimony here, and certainly we've heard it elsewhere, that whatever the good intentions of, uh, of the, with the creation of FCIP, it's been abused. It's been used to circumvent the system. It's been used to, uh, for non-competitive hiring. It's been used for favoritism. It's even been used for nepotism. I was at a federal agency the other day where I heard legion complaints about that practice by a uh, palace guard surrounding the secretariat, uh, both in the previous administration and, and still there now. Um, fair criticism, and what should we do about it? Uh, again, our, our, our stance is, is that we, we really need to take a, a deep look at it and, and, and see what works with it and what doesn't work with it. Um, ultimately, uh, Representative Connolly, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, you're my representative here, here in the House. And, um, and you I, I, I you take, are a wonderful person. I, I, take Metro, I take Metro in every day along the Orange Line, and I get to see how many people don't have uh, at least two people in their car during HOV. Um, our solution to that isn't to shut down uh, HOV during rush hour, which would prohibit uh, good quality workers from getting to work and strand people outside of the box. Our solution to that is to en is, is enforcement where there's violations. So I think, you know, certainly one of the things that we have to take a better look at is have we been enforcing where violation has actually taken place? Is it is it is that the response to FCIP, or is it simply to say this isn't working? People are violating, and therefore we make it available to no one, even those who are using it applying veterans preference as it's supposed to be applied and and again using it in good faith. Uh, Ms. Embry, uh, that segues nicely into your testimony. You testified that if you took away Homeland Security, uh, uh, the Defense Department and uh, Veterans Affairs and you looked at the remainder of the federal workforce, le fewer than 10 percent of the employees of, of that remainder uh, are in fact veterans, which would suggest, you suggested, uh, that some circumvention of veterans' preference is going on. Um, how would you correct that, and what do you think we ought to do about it? Uh, thank you very much, sir. I, actually, I, the numbers don't lie. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is it's a larger problem than just people abusing the, the FCIP. What it is, is there's a lack of translation. A lot of times when you hear folks talk about hiring a veteran, they say the veteran will be on time, they'll be dressed well, and they'll be respectful, and they won't do drugs. And as a veteran, I find that insulting because I, yes, I will be on time, I won't do drugs, I'll dress well, but I also have management skills. I learned how to work with, within a budget when I, when I led Marines. And any platoon sergeant, squad leader, uh, company commander, they have more management experience than the average small business owner. These folks manage not just their seven day work week, they, or five day work week, they manage seven days a week for these folks. Not just the individuals, their whole families, be it their housing, their pay, their food. So what the problem comes down to is a lot of folks, a lot of these, these hiring folks throughout federal government don't understand that. They see veterans preference as, a, as a, uh, an extra weight to put on their shoulders during the hiring process. 
they don't see the assets that these veterans bring to the table. And I think that's a major problem. The major problem is it's just a, a, a major uh, level of ignorance across the board. And as veterans, that's partly our responsibility too. We need to learn the buzzwords. We need to learn how our, our skills translate over. But at the same time, the federal government, I mean, the amount of money that's wasted by not reinvesting in our veterans and bringing them back into the fold of public service is just, it, it's mind numbing. So it needs to fall on federal government as well as, as the veteran community, as well as the business community. So right now, uh, the, the strategic plan out there is a good start. We feel the VSO community, not just IAVA, but all the VSO community must be, in, in, uh, must be a part of this process to make sure we are telling folks these management skills and these business skills that veterans do bring to the table. Thank you. Uh, my time is almost up, Mr. Chairman, but if I had a little bit more time, I'd probably ask Mr. Holloway uh, whether there are best practices in state and local governments and in the private sector that uh, you think the federal government could benefit from in terms of the quality of hiring and the process of hiring. I mean, I think the real question here is the enforcement. Uh, you know, the President has uh, outlined a program, and the problem actually is the middle managers that uh, career middle managers who won't implement the program as we see it. So as long as uh, Director Berry uh, puts in place uh, a program to make sure that people follow the lead of the president and OPM, I think we'll be way ahead of it. Uh, as far as uh, veterans uh, hiring is concerned in Massachusetts, uh, we have uh, a veterans preference. So if there's a civil service exam, the veterans go to the, uh, the top of the list. Disabled veterans actually go above them. Uh, and they're not given the point system that uh, was talked about earlier. But uh, I, I really think it's the, the president and uh, the director are onto something here. And we, what we want to do is give them as many tools as possible to fill these jobs in an expeditious manner with the best possible applicants to fill the job so we can deliver services to the American people. Okay, thank you. Uh, President Hallway, just following up on that, uh, you were saying early on, because you, you've been in office for a number of years, you've seen uh, what's transpired. Incumbency is a wonderful thing, Mr. Chairman. What's that? Incumbency is a wonderful thing. It is, it is. The, mo the longer I'm here, the more I appreciate seniority. Uh, I remember correctly the first time you ran, you said, give a young man a chance, and now you're saying experience counts. Is that that's correct? right. That's, that's right. The, uh, you've been able to see the, at least over the past 16 years, where we've had these problems and they have not been uh, addressed. No one has really attempted to, to, to tackle this thing. And, uh, you know, now here is President Obama and Director Berry. I give them great credit. Uh, what do you see is, is the key, um, I mean, you mentioned enforcement in terms of making sure that, uh, I, I know in Massachusetts you have uh, veterans uh, preference, but you also have uh, veterans agents in every single town that, that inform the veterans about what their rights and, and, uh, and opportunities might be. And then you have in government, you also have veterans agents there at the agencies that are, that are protecting those preferences. Is that something that you're seeing nationally, or is it something we're going to need to have, uh, have to pay greater attention to? Well, I think what Director Berry said uh, earlier was that uh, each of the agencies are going to have somebody that is charged with overseeing uh, veterans being placed in these positions. In Massachusetts, at all the job centers, there is a, uh, one a veteran uh, who's assigned to helping veterans find those jobs, be they public or, or, or private. But I think that the administration is onto something here to give somebody the responsibility to just do that to right. make sure the veterans uh, have a shot at these jobs and uh, that those numbers that were spoken about earlier of 8 or 10 percent do in fact climb up to approach where the Department of Defense is and the VA is. Right. Uh, Ms. Simon, uh, thank you for, for your testimony here today. Tell me a little bit about uh, how the uh, federal Career Internship Program, the FCIP, uh, is, is implemented at, at DHS. How, how does that work? Well, um, in preparing for today's hearing, I found on the uh, U.S. 
uh, Marshal Service webpage a, a job announcement for deputy U.S. Marshal positions. Um, and it says here, the U.S. Marshal Service is currently um, limited to hiring individuals under the following programs, First, and it's two career programs, FCIP and the Centralized Student Career Experience Program. In other words, uh, the agency was hiring exclusively under essentially FCIP. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. Obviously, the people we represent right now are, are already um, hired into the federal government, but a lot of them are veterans. We don't know exactly the number of our membership that are veterans, but we estimate something close to 40 percent and even more than that in certain agencies, obviously DOD, uh, DVA, and, and DHS. And, is, um, that, is that residual or, I mean, you, you obviously since September 11, 2001, we, ex we combined, consolidated a bunch of agencies. We uh -huh. actually uh, started doing ro more robust security. So there was hiring at the borders, hiring at the airports. Uh, so is the, the percentage of veterans in place, is that residual? And we've departed from that now? I can't, I don't even know. Yeah, the answer. okay. I mean, it's an estimate of, of our current membership. But, but it's just that I, what I wanted to, to say was that FCIP inhibits uh, career development opportunities for those veterans as well, uh, either lateral moves or uh, opportunities for promotion. Um, in the same way that, that veterans who are outside the government are having a hard time getting in because of the you know, limited. Um, uh, advertisement of jobs through FCIP, um, people who are already federal employees and who have been preparing to make a move upward or sideways or wherever are, are inhibited because these jobs are reserved for FCIP and, and our members aren't given the opportunity to compete or um, have their veteran status count for anything in, in their effort to improve their situation. Um, we hear it from throughout DHS, we hear it in the Social Security Administration. Um, and I, I, I can't remember, I think it was Director Berry who cited uh, data saying that a lot of people uh, who are veterans have been hired under FCIP, and we hear that from our Border Patrol Council. Um, but that's, that is in some ways beside the point. Um, the fact that it's perfectly legal to evade veterans' preference within the FCIP is the problem. We want to make it impossible to evade veterans' preference, um, you know, except in very extraordinary circumstances. And there's nothing illegal necessarily, or maybe there will be proved to be something illegal about exercise of, of the authorities under the FCIP. Um, but there are sh there's clearly shortcomings when when they're capable of using it to um, you know av avoid the application of veterans preference. Yeah, I just uh, you know I, I could understand as you say there there are examples of particular individuals and and especially if they deal with policy uh, and that have very exacting requirements that I, I could see that. Uh, an individual agency might say this particular position or these positions, this handful of positions need to be uh, filled with such exact uh, requirements that it may require them to go outside uh, the competitive practice. But what we're seeing is thousands, tens of thousands, uh, people brought in through a, a process that is completely, uh, well, it, it's, it's ignoring the, the veteran's preference that we've put in place. It's ignoring the law. It's ignoring veteran's preference, but I think we, you know, just logically we have a hard time understanding um, if, you know, your, your requirements are such that you need someone who's truly extraordinary. The truly extraordinary people are going to survive the competitive process. In fact, they'll, they're the ones who will excel in the competitive process. Yeah. So um, FCIP is, we think, a way of really avoiding the merit system principles and veteran's preference, um, not necessarily to uh, hire the most excellent candidates, um, but uh, just to do things quickly and simply and, and not take the time to do what's required of a, of a public entity like the federal government and make sure that you have open competition, open advertisement so that everyone in the American public has an equal chance of, of competing for these jobs. That's how you really get the best federal, federal worker. Very good. Mr. Embry, uh, 
you know, I've spent a fair, fair time uh, myself with our, our men and women in uniform in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they are probably the most wired group in terms of uh, being on the Internet. I get the emails all the time, uh, and, uh, you know, it, we have instantaneous connection with our, our troops in the field. So, I mean, this would seem to be a perfect opportunity, and, and you know, I have an opportunity to sit with, with members of our, our armed for, forces uh, overseas, and oftentimes when they're six months away or four months away from uh, redeploying back to the States, you know, they're, they're questioning me about what opportunities there are back home. They're worried about, you know, getting back in their home lives, getting back to work. Uh, this would seem like a perfect opportunity for us to create that connection for them while they're still in Afghanistan, while they're still in Iraq, anticipating coming home or, or even, you know, if they go back to Fort Drum or Fort Dix or wherever they, they go back to uh, when they're deployed home, there's, there's, you know, we make use of that time with reconnecting them into, into jobs and job opportunities. Is that being, is that being optimized right now, uh, that opportunity to, to make sure that our men and women in uniform know they have a job to come back to and know that, that this, this country embraces them and, and wants to make sure that, uh, you know, they get the, the consideration and the, the respect that they've earned by their service? Uh, well, sir, thank you for the question. Um, first off, I want to begin explaining uh, I took my boots off over two years ago, so I can't say exactly what's happening to the guys in the field still humping a pack, carrying a rifle. But when I was still there finishing my second deployment, no. The short answer is no. They don't, you don't feel like you're supported when you're coming back. At least you didn't back in 2007. Now, maybe it's getting better. I think the first steps have begun. I think uh, Department of Labor vets, uh, Assistant Secretary Jefferson is on the right path. He's, uh, he's talking to the VSO community. He's talking to uh, you know, different businesses. He's talking to, to just the individual Marines, soldiers, sailors, and, and, and airmen about the different skills they bring and how to translate them over. And that's one thing that IAVA has been asking for is a study to find out, one, what kind of training translates. So if I'm, a, if I'm a corpsman, a Navy corpsman on the green side, and I'm doing you know, field trauma work, tracheotomies, uh, putting in IVs, uh, you, know, you name it, uh, sucking chest wounds, uh, and, and I get to the civilian side, after all that experience, I barely qualify to drive an ambulance. So what we're asking for is a study to identify the kind of skill level and the, and the kind of schooling and education that the military gives you and how to translate it over to the civilian side. And what we want, though, is we want that to better the training for our fighting force as well as make the transition easier so when they are coming from the military side to the civilian side, the civilian side can automatically look and say, oh, I make sense. You were uh, this MOS, so you must have had these courses. So we automatically know that, oh, if you were a platoon sergeant, I know for a fact that you managed to be at 80 people and you managed a budget of a couple million dollars a quarter and you manage these kind of timelines. So I know for a fact I could put you in front of 20, uh, and as a manager, over 20 people very comfortably, and you would meet all the timelines, you'd meet all the goals. So that's one step that needs to happen, and, and we've talked to a few offices, folks are, folks are having that discussion. We feel Secretary Jefferson and others, uh, and OPM, are going towards the right uh, direction right now, but it also goes to the TAPS program. Now, what TAPS is is Transition Assistance Program, and this is what the Marines and sailors and soldiers and airmen you're talking about. You know, they're about to leave, leave sector, and they're thinking, okay, what am I going to do now? I'm short. I only got about seven months left in. I want to go be a police officer. I want to, you know, go work in the post office, or I don't know what I want to do, and maybe I want to stay in public service. Well, this is the program that's supposed to teach them how to write the resume how to translate their skills so when they are having an interview, they know how to, to sell themselves, uh, teaches them how to present themselves to a hiring agent. Unfortunately, the program is just woefully out of date. I believe it's been 17 years since it's been updated. Now, DOL is talking about ways to update it, but right now it's still death by PowerPoint, and it's not even, uh, it's not even something that you have to do. It's not mandatory. Mm. Marine yeah. Corps has just recently made it mandatory, but still, mandatory bad information doesn't make it good information. It just makes you have to sit through it. So there are a lot of good starts. Um, we feel that uh, unfortunately, uh, once a lot of these discussions have begun and then the VSO community starts pointing out some of the flaws and some of the first ideas, 
that people sometimes get, uh, I guess, their feelings hurt and they, they don't want to take the constructive criticism. And I think that sometimes slows down the process. But we need to, I think the way to solve that is to keep the VSO community involved in every step of the way. I believe that uh, the, the committee right now, the interagency committee uh, to implement the strategic plan that OPM has rolled out is phenomenal. And that's a great start. We would like the VSO community to have some input. Uh, just before each meeting, let, you know, give us an idea of what kind of things the interagency council is going to discuss so we can send you guys some well-researched information. IAVA has their own research department. We put out reports every year. We put out a legislative agenda. We, we end note these things with hundreds and hundreds of sources to help these staffs. Let me, so, let me just interrupt. I, I know they're going to do the second vote, and I'll have to go for the second, third, and fourth votes uh, because they are substantive. But uh, it seems to me, just in interacting with those young men and women who are about to come back, you know, the military is rightly focused on, on their responsibility in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And when folks are deploying out, uh, it's a step-down process. And so uh, I think the intensity of, of following those folks when they're redeploying back home is, is less than when they are the, you know, part of the operation, uh, the military operation uh, in, in those countries. And I'm just wondering, you know, it seems to be a, a one-way street. In other words, I have men and women on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan who are trying to tie back into, into the United States into jobs. Mm -hmm. And they are doing it as individuals. There's no, doesn't seem to be any concerted effort to get them placed back here. And there doesn't seem to be any effort on our part to reach over there and, and close that loop and to make sure that those folks know about the opportunities. And so there's, there's a dialogue, a two-way street of information going back and forth and reassurances for them and their families of what opportunities might be there when they finish their, their tour of duty. So I guess what I'm asking, would it, would it be helpful uh, in terms of this, these individual agents who will be, you know, that Mr. Holloway described that, uh, that Director Berry is gonna put, going to put in place at these agencies, that there be a, you know, a two-way street, a, a bi-directional, uh, you know, uh, discourse so that we let people know over there what's available so that, you know, they, they feel like they are, are wanted, that they are uh, welcomed and embraced, and, and that they're a priority in terms of our federal hiring pra practices. Uh, well, sir, I don't want to speak outside of my lane too far, so I'd like to say that IAVA would love to work with your staff to uh, put together some sort of plan for that or yeah. a proposal for that just because I think there uh, needs to be a lot of input from DOD as well as other government agencies, so I don't want to speak. Sure. Yeah, I, I understand. And, and, and I'm not talking about allowing private recruitment of military in theater mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they've got enough to do uh, Department of Defense with just focusing on job one while they're there. I'm talking about in that step-down process where, uh, you know, I know that uh, in many cases, uh, you know, units will have their personal belongings sent home 90 days ahead of time. And so now they're really in a sort of a the decompressed mode where they're stepping down into civilian life. I think, you know, you, if you can utilize that time period just to have people get in touch with them and let them know what's, what's going on, that might be a better, uh, you know, offer a better result. Um, Dean Crosby, uh, let, let's talk about the student opportunities here for a minute. And uh, I am certain that we can benefit by having greater flexibility. I think. Part of the problem that we're seeing, look, people wouldn't be circumventing this system if it was working. You know, so that's, that's a problem, and we've got to create some flexibility here. Could you talk about uh, what you see as being uh, some of the obstacles of, uh, of opening up opportunities for very uh, well-educated, well-trained uh, young people coming out of our colleges and, and, uh, and uh, graduate schools uh, in terms of connecting with the demand that we have for their services in the federal government? Well, I think the obstacles have been pretty clearly discussed here. Uh, the, the, the nature of the systems, as is so often the case, you put protections in place and over time they become calcified and, 
and um, uh, no longer work, if nobody's been looking at these systems. The FSIP, I don't know anything about this FSIP program in any formal way, but just from what I've heard today, it's clear that the, the hiring system is trying to find a way around a calcified, non-functional, you know, 160 to 200 day process, and any, no manager anywhere can survive in that kind of an environment. Probably a lot of it is not to get around veterans or whatever benefits per se, it's just to try to get around this horrible system. That's the same with the issues of, of, of students who are trying to access the system. It's particularly difficult in the case of, of our graduate students and the graduate programs that are represented by me today um, because these people don't have um, senior, any kind of seniority, any kind of experience in the federal system. We hope that they will have veteran status and we, we're, we're hoping the GI Bill is a terrific asset at this point and collaborating with veterans organizations to get them into these programs, take their experience, take their leadership skills, couple it with our formal education skills, now you've really got an applicant. Um, but the rest of our students who are not veterans have this very specialized set of skills that doesn't give them any status in the hiring system. None right. of the metrics or few of the metrics reward the kinds of special skills that graduates of our programs have. So they're left to, to fall behind in a system which is precluding people who are specifically trained to deal with the exigencies of public administration and public policy. So the kinds of opportunities, these specialized channels for students, such as in 3264, uh, that I know you understand well, um, not at numbers that are going to change the whole order of magnitude of the employment system, but to bring us, give a special uh, channel, a special pathway for people with these special skills, um, that's what we're looking for. And I think that in the long run can have a tremendously positive impact on public service without in any significant way stepping on other legitimate rights and interests. Um, Mr. McManus, the same, same question, but in light of uh, the President's initiative here, uh, are there components there that would, uh, would clear the wave with some of the, the obstructions that have existed previously and, and some that Mr. Cro Dean Crosby has uh, uh, articulated? Yeah, I think certainly all of the, um, all of the issues that Dean Crosby are articulated are, are, are spot on. Um, in, in terms of helping to clear, clear the pathway. Um, much like uh, the discussion earlier about um, veterans not actually understanding uh, how to translate their skills, um, I think the same is actually true on, on a college university campus as well. Um, unfortunately, government doesn't value um, education as much as it does in the seat um, experience. Uh, and, and, and that has to, in, in, in fact, uh, change. And that's a cultural change as much as a procedural or, 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 or process change. Um, we've got to do more to make uh, students aware of the opportunities that exist, um, much like I think we have to do. And um, the partnership would welcome the opportunity to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and also Mr. Embre, to, to figure out how we can effectively educate vets about opportunities and how they can compete as well. Um, I think you know, those, those, those two audiences are facing some very similar issues in this. Well, uh, I apologize. I'm going to be happy. I'll have to go back and, and vote again. Uh, I am going to leave, there were obviously dueling committee hearings at the same time. So I'm going to leave the record open for five uh, legislative days for my colleagues to submit any questions they might have for you and any other testimony to be submitted. I want to thank you for your willingness to come forward and help the committee with its work. Uh, I really do appreciate it. It makes a better process and I think a as we move forward, you know, with the House version of, of, of our hiring bill, uh, I think we will be well served by your testimony and, uh, and the whole process will be better informed by your input. So I appreciate your, your, your testimony. I thank you and I wish you have a good day. Thank you. This uh, committee hearing is now adjourned.